Very good afternoon, brothers and sisters in Christ. I was glad to be able to come again uh, to share in the English worship and uh, uh, continue to polish my English, I guess. <laughs> so today, the passage that we uh, are reading, uh, we're going to look at, it's about um, a king. It's about installing a king and what this king should or should not be doing in order to gain God's favor. So the question is, does this passage then applies to us? Any of us here that is a king of royal descent that we do not know of? I mean, other than spiritually, of course, I think we're not kings, but um, in quite a few ways, we are, we are like kings today. I found on, online this t-shirt that says, live like a king. Okay? And I guess as I was reflecting, we are these days probably eating better than kings, right? at least occasionally, I hope only occasionally, and we are being entertained even better than kings ever had, you know, with all the movie industries and uh, all different kind of entertainment. We also have uh, surpassed the resources of a king in terms, especially in terms of uh, the knowledge available to us in this unprecedented time when we can actually um, learn and find out all information in the world at the, just uh, at the tip of our fingers, right? And now it's even faster with the, what do you call that? Chat GPT, is it? <laughs> we also have uh, the freedom of a king. Well, most of the time we can do almost anything we want as long as we do not go and interfere others. But I guess with all these benefits, the danger of being a king is also upon us. The danger of a king is actually that we can almost do anything we want with no adverse repercussions. We can... Um, this such an advantage can actually cause a skew in our mindset to think that we can really get away with anything and that there is no consequences even when we are defiant and when we sin against God. So today, more than ever, is necessary for us to rethink this topic. Today, as we look at the world and especially in this area of the emphasis on freedom, the right to be free, to choose, to, to speak, the demand to be heard, the demand for privacy. Basically, it is quite dangerous when we demand to have the right to hide things from the public and not you know, things that we do not want the world to know, we have the right to hide it, and that's our privacy. Hence, it also puts us a lot in, into a lot more temptation than um, kings in the biblical times. And it is therefore important for us today to take heed from the warning that God has given to the kings. So let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you bless us with so much uh, blessing in these days and age. And we thank you that uh, you've given us opportunity to worship freely and to enjoy the abundance that we can uh, attain. But Lord, help us to be wary of the temptations that it encompasses and that we can be careful with our life 
and the way we use the freedom and the blessings that we have. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So for today's um, sermon, I have a few points. First one being that God knows what we need and prepared it for us beforehand. The verse today is actually taken from uh, Moses' um, record of what God has commanded the Israelites to do. It is instruction for them to follow, specifically when they have entered the promised land and to enjoy God's special blessing. Well, they are mostly, in Deuteronomy, mostly general uh, teaching on normal day living. But today's passage refers to a specific situation. The situation when the Israelites will ask for a king. And through Moses, God spoke it clearly that the day will come when the people will want to have a king. So these words were spoken about 380 to 400 years before it actually happened. It was recorded in Deuteronomy by Moses so clearly that later some modern day scholar used this passage to assert that part of Deuteronomy was written much later than Moses' time. Only uh, it was that they, they were written only after Israelite has had their kings and the mistakes of the kings have been felt by the nations. So then the Israelites formulate this prediction and insert it back into Deuteronomy. And that's what they claim. Well, this is a base, basis, it's based on their assumption that there is no God or that God did not interfere with human history. Especially that he did not make such prediction with such accuracy. But we know that God is real. We know that he cares for his people. And so God does intervene in our life. Hence, he we believe very clearly that he did warn the Israelites before they ever had a chance to think about having a king. Just like God knew what the Israelites needed, he also knows what we need today. He has put in the Bible words to warn us words to encourage us, words to show us the way, and most importantly, words that tells us how much he loves us. I remember in my uh, youth or young adult days when I was in tertiary, there was this sharing that a, a speaker has uh, shared. And one of the illustrations that he I think it was, yeah, it was a she, uh, a lady um, theological student that was with us. She shared with us that something that I remember until today. She said that the, um, the word of God is not just a book of law. It is actually a love letter. A love letter from God to us. I think this idea that God in his word is trying to tell us how he wants our relationship with him to grow in love is something that really changed my heart and changed my attitude towards God's word. And I started to enjoy reading the word of God daily. And that was the period for the first time in my life that I finished reading the whole Bible. God knows us, each and every one of us. He knows our needs. 
And from the time he led the author of the Bible to write the books, he has already inserted in the scripture the words that we need. And then he let us have the Holy Spirit living in us to help us understand his words and what he's trying to tell us as we read the Bible. So let us recognize that God's word is fully relevant to us today and let us start making it really a part of our daily reading and learning. The second point is that God's word guide us from the pitfalls of life. In the scripture verses, it talks about the temptation that a king will face and the things that he's not supposed to do. So God warns them of four, four pitfalls that a king might face. So we look at it, look at them one at a time. The first one is that they have to make the right choice for a king. To only install a brother, a fellow Israelites, their own people, to be a king. I think the emphasis here is that a king that needs to lead the nation of Israel needs to be one of them. He needs, he needs to have the faith and the right relationship with God. Hence, he needs to be one chosen by God. He needs to be one that recognizes his lordship. He cannot be a foreigner, a person without faith. He cannot be someone who doesn't really know God, no matter how good he is, how talented he is, how qualified he might be to become a king. Leading God's people must be done God's way. Therefore, it requires a person who truly believes in God and is willing to truly seek and to submit to God's leading and to do things His way. God wants us not just to get the job done. He wants us to do it right, to do it His way. Second, we see that the king must not strengthen his army with horses, specifically mentioned here, horses and I believe also chariots. This basically is the use of worldly ways to strengthen his army, the ability to defend the nation and most likely also secure his posi position as the king. Strengthening defense has always been a good excuse to make compromises on rules and restrictions. So it is very really an area that we need to be careful. God is the real defense of Israel. He has shown many times in their history that he can neutralize the enemy no matter how big the army is without even sacrificing one Israeli, Israelite soldiers. These events are all recorded in the Bible and reading the stories, the incidents, the record of the events that happened in the history of the Israelites help us believe that our God is almighty and he is faithful. God wants us to trust him, to trust him to be our defense, to be our supply. And trusting him frees us from the need to make compromises, to be able to really do the right thing. It gives us the opportunity to experience his help and that experience when we have walked through it in turn turns into strengthening our faith once again. 
so that we can then trust Him in bigger things. This is the positive cycle that God hopes will help us continue to grow and mature in our faith. Thirdly, the king should not acquire many wives or gold and silver. Well, specifically, let's focus on the wives. Not to say that today it is easy to have many wives. Why not many wives? Because one is enough. Or one is tough enough. Trouble enough. <laughs> I'm going to get into trouble after this. <laughs> in the olden times, in the biblical uh, times, royal marriages is also a way to form alliance and treaty with other nations around. And it is a worldly way to increase the security of the nation. The world focuses on gaining the favor of the powerful nations nearby. But we focus on gaining God's favor. God is warning the kings, and I believe today all men, the importance of guarding the ways into our hearts. Your wife has a special power to influence you. Do you agree? Better not your head, especially if your wife is sitting beside you. We have to choose wisely. We need to choose one that chooses God so that in life we know that our path will be aligned together. We need to spend time understanding and nurturing her with the word of God, nurturing her, not lecturing her. Be loving, be understanding, be gentle. Well, for the wives among us, we do know, you do know, that you have an influence on your husband. Hence, with great power comes great responsibility. How would God want you to use it? What does God want you to do as a godly wife? In, biblically, it says you are to be your husband's helper, to help him. You know, he may look tough on the outside, but actually he's very soft and weak on the inside. Just that society has forced us to build a tough exterior, an outer shell that looks tough. But you know that when he married you, he has chosen to be vulnerable to you to give you access to his most vulnerable part, his heart. In the Bible, it says that you are made from his ribs. You are right beside his heart. You can protect it, the heart or you can step it. Your choice. He needs you to give him confidence he needs you to be there to support and meet his needs. Most importantly, he needs you to pray for him. Pray for his relationship with God. Pray that he will put God first. Not you. God first. Pray that he will follow God's way and not your way. And pray that he will seek God's favor and not your pleasure. When he truly seeks God, God will help him to love you with the true love that you really need. The fourth point, skipping to verse four, uh, sorry, verse 20, the fourth pitfall that we, the kings need to avoid is not to see himself higher than others. Not to veer from God's path, either on the left or on the right. 
God require, requires a king to keep his eyes on his words so that he will not mistakenly see himself higher than his brothers, the people around him. To think that what he does is more important. To think that he is above the rules. To think that because he's more important and he's busy, he deserves exceptions. As a king, he needs to be on the right path because he's leading the nation, a big group of God's people. Hence, we need to know that he needs to know God well and to have his words in his heart. To keep in our heart the word of God. To let the word of God guide our decision is what we need to do. When we accepted Jesus Christ and we got saved and we have a place secured in heaven, Do you find it odd that God did not bring us straight up to heaven? Why is that so? Why when you pray to receive Christ and you have a place in heaven, God don't just phew, bring you up straight away? It's a scary thing, I guess. But God kept us on earth because He wants us to grow, to learn, to learn how to walk in the Lord. It's like Moses. When Moses led the people of Israelites out of Egypt, God didn't want him to bring the Israelites straight into Canaan, straight into the promised land. But God ordered Moses to bring them to Mount Sinai first so that they can come to know God, to start a relationship with God, to, to really build upon a relationship with this living God that includes recalling how God has saved them out of slavery from Egypt. It includes making a covenant with God to be His people and to trust Him as their one and only God. Why? Because the promised land, the land of Canaan that they are going into, has plenty of false God, and they can be quickly led astray if they have not anchored their faith in the one true God. Well, in the same way, God wants us to trust Him, to believe in Him only, not because He's insecure, but to recognize Him as the one true God because that is the truth and that is the most important truth that immunizes us from the falsehood of this world, from the false God, from the worldly values that will influence, will try to influence us every day as we try to live our life. The world, based on its self-serving, self-indulging values, will try to make us follow them. But we must focus our eyes on the Lord and anchor our thoughts in His Word so that we do not get led astray we do not get cheated. So what do we do? How should we let the word of God be in our heart? We need to let his word fill us up. Not just in our mind, as in studying and knowing what it says, but to fill our heart with his words so that we can feel his love telling us and encouraging us to follow his words because it is out of his love that he is telling us all this. 
it helps us to know that he has our best interests in his heart. We also need to learn to generate a willingness to obey him. To let our heart be strengthened, let our will be strengthened to obey his commandments and to decide and to keep on this path that God has set us upon. Even when times become difficult, even when there is a cost we have to pay to follow our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 18 to 19, he gives us some of the tips of how to put the word of God in our heart. Firstly, sorry, firstly is this one, is that the king should copy one copy of the the, the words of uh, the scripture by hand. Copying the word of God for himself by hand. I don't know whether any of us have tried that. Just one book. <laughs> it requires the king to spend time writing every single word every single uh, letter to make every mark of, um, on, on the, on the uh, scripture. Spending time writing it out, I think, helped the king to focus on the word of God, to notice the details, to rethink what it meant and to really understand what God is trying to say. Secondly, the king needs to get this copy of uh, his, his manuscript certified by the Levitical priest. Well, I think this process reminds the king that though he is the top man in the kingdom, he is under God and he is bound by the words of God so that he can learn to fear God all his life. Thirdly, we see that he is to keep a copy of this uh, scripture with him and he is to read it all the days of his life. A daily reading will surely help remind the king who gave him the throne and the power to rule the nation. This daily re reading throughout his life also points out that it is not a been there, done that deal. In scripture, in our, our relationship with the word of God is never completed. No matter whether you've read through the Bible, whether you've finished the whole series of the BSF uh, classes, whether you've gone through uh, our foundational um, biblical class in church, there is no completion in learning the Word of God. And this reading, this daily reading by the King reminds us that we too need to let the Word of God start our day every day so that we our mind is focused on him and our decisions will then also be guided by him finally whoops sorry go back <laughs> finally the king is supposed to keep the word and to do it basically he is to put it into practice it, this putting it into practice, doing the word of God, would cover both turning away from the things that he should not do and actively doing the things that God has commanded him to do. This in practice would help us today to internalize the word of God into our hearts. So, the word of God 
is important for each and every one of us. But we thank God that in the New Testament, the Word became flesh and lived among us. Our Lord Jesus Christ came in the flesh to show us how to live. He gave in His coming, in His dying on the cross, in His resurrection, He gave us the freedom from the bondage of sin, from the inability to actually do God's will. And He gave us this new life with the Holy Spirit living in us that we can do His will. The living word gave us the example to follow. He continued, he completed the salvation plan and he continued to live in us through the Holy Spirit. And this is the life that God wants us to live each and every day. So let us close today's uh, sermon with this verse from Galatians 2.20 and I invite every one of us to read it together as a declaration of our conviction to let our Lord Jesus Christ live in us, the living word. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that not only did you give us your word and show us the way, you came and you died for us and you resurrected and gave us the new life that we now in you and in the help of the Holy Spirit can actually live a life that is in obedience to your words. Help us not to be discouraged when we trip and fall, but to rise up again and continue to walk on because we know you are waiting for us at the finish line. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.